The beauty about being a neurological surgeon, almost different than any other profession in the world, I think, is you always have plan C, plan D, plan B, plan C, plan D, plan Z. Because neurosurgeons, you're inside a spinal cord or brain, um, have to be agile. Welcome to the Nurse Surgery Podcast. I'm Mike Wang, and I'm here with my co-host, Jake P. Colson. We are here to discuss all things neurosurgical. Hi, this is J.P. Colson, a resident in neurosurgery at Rush University. Please note that this is not a CME event, and the opinions and statements made in this podcast do not reflect those of any institution or professional organization. Now, let's get started. Great. So today we are very fortunate to be joined uh, by Rich Ellenbogen and my co-host John Paul is unfortunately called away to the typical thing, which is duties as a neurosurgeon. So it's just me and Rich here today. Rich, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. I love being on podcast. Well, that's great. So let me just introduce you a little bit and you can tell us a little about your background. Okay. But I've always, I mean, I first met you through Mike Apuzo, one of my mentors, and, and I, I know you're chair of neurosurgery at University of Washington. And uh, you have a, had, a, had a storied service history with the U.S. military, with the U.S. Army. Yes. Your wife uh, was, a, was a nurse in the Army. She's a colonel? That's right. Or? No, she was, uh, she still outranks me. But, <laughs> <laughs> but she was, no, she was a captain when I met her in the Army. Um, but her data rank was ahead of mine. So, ah, I got it. And got she it. reminds me of that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> in the home and outside, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you, you ran uh, nurse surgery for Walter Reed. You were head there, right? Yes, correct. Okay, great, great, fantastic. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background first? Well, you know, I'm, I'm a, a true imposter, like uh, many of us that wake up one morning and we realize we're neurological surgeons. Can you believe they pay us to do that? I right. cannot believe. One of the, probably, right, the greatest job in the world, okay? And I uh, did not come from a family of physicians. Uh, I grew up in New York and... Uh, one day I found myself at a, a program at Columbia University. Not, it's not where I went to undergraduate school, but when I was in high school, that kind of inspired me. Uh, and there was this guy named Candle mm. talking about neuroscience and aplasia. From Candle and Shorts. From Eric Candle Candel. Shorts. Yeah, that was, yeah. So the Nobel laureate, and I'm, you know, some 15 year old kid sitting in a classroom. So I got totally inspired to study um, biochemistry and neurosciences. And I joined the army when I was a teenager because I couldn't pay for wow. college and medical school. So I joined the army just to piss off my dad because he was a World War II Navy guy. You know? <laughs> and he said, this will make you a man. So just join the army, Navy or Air Force. So I did that and it really changed my life. They paid for my schooling. Uh, I uh, never regretted a day of that. I, uh, uh, I, I, I met my wife there, uh, who was an army nurse, and uh, we had three kids in the army, and it was, and it's been great. That's great. And from there, I went to the University of Washington. It kind of propelled me into back into academics, and I have had the most fun in the world that you can have being a neurological surgeon. Well, thank you for your service, and we've had a number of guests on who are uh, who have had. A, a real career, if you will, inside the U.S. military, and I'm, I'm, uh, my hats off to you. It's a, it's a, it's a true calling, and now you're heading up one of the most important um, academic centers in this country. Well, thank you. Uh, maybe one of the most, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, most pedigreed in terms of the new university world in terms of NIH funding and basic science research and technology, right? Right, and also it's the only freestanding, it's on the only university medical center for five states. Yeah, five states. Five states, so we're the only level one trauma center in 27% of the landmass of America wow. is at the University of Washington, the only freestanding children's hospital. So it's sort of unique, it's very different than where I grew up in New York. I mean, it's a very rural states, five rural states, 
Um, but they've come up with a triage system that's pretty brilliant. You invented EMS in, in Seattle, right? Well, they, they, I didn't. I mean, I, I wasn't <laughs> you born. You Seattle people did. Yeah, I wasn't born yet, but the whole EMS system came from a bunch of guys that got out of the Army and then landed in Seattle and said, wait a second, with helicopters and planes, we can connect all these rural areas from Alaska to Wyoming uh, to eastern Washington. Yeah, so that five states, it's Washington, Alaska, North Dakota, South Dakota. No, no, okay. Washington, the five Northwest states, okay. I can tell you from the East Coast. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> Washington, Wyoming, Alaska, Montana, Idaho. Ah, okay. And, and so the way it works is there's one medical school all right and so they save 20 seats for the folks from wyoming maybe 40 seats for the people from alaska you know 20 seats for the folks from uh, uh, idaho and, and and so on and so that they don't have medical schools in idaho and uh, wyoming and alaska but you you get in through those states and then you come to Seattle to do your mm, uh, I see. So it's it's a fascinating it's so, it's so different than yeah. uh, an urban environment. So I actually the first time I met you I was introduced to you by Dr. A, but the first time I met you actually I was a sub I in Seattle and I was at Stanford doing medical school and we spent a month all the guys came yeah. up to Seattle cuz yeah. that was the place, right? Right. And I had met you uh, at the university hospital there and and it's really struck me you're actually doing a very complicated case and um it's kind of like along the lines of what we want to talk about today which is you know having been in the military now now a neurosurgeon um how do you how do you have agility right so like everybody's got their plan a right but then how do you have like a plan b c d like things don't always work out exactly like how you planned it so what do you do next and, and maybe you can tell us about how that plays out in, in your field as a neurosurgeon, as a chairman, and military, et cetera. Yeah, I think the one thing that I learned uh, as a neurological surgeon and also from the military is that whether it be uh, the conduct of a case, an operation on a human being, or it be uh, in the battlefield, or it be things never go the way you plan them mm -hmm. to go, or rarely do they do that. Um, in an operation, I would say probably 95% of the time you pray and hope it goes exactly as you planned it, and it does. But the beauty about being a neurological surgery, almost different than any other profession in the world, I think, is you always have plan C, plan D, plan B, plan C, plan D, plan Z. Because neurosurgeons, you're inside a spinal cord or brain, um, have to be agile, right? Mm -hmm. And um, we think on our feet. Uh, after all, it's the longest training in all of medicine, seven mm -hmm. years, right? Right. And you, to be a neurological surgeon, will have at least a thousand times in your training some time when something didn't go exactly as planned. Whether it be going, being a resident, going down to the emergency room, thinking you're seeing someone that fell down, but instead what they have is a brain tumor. Thinking you're seeing uh, somebody uh, that was in a motor vehicle accident, but they're not moving their legs. And just to be clear for our listeners, because it's a diverse audience, we're not necessarily saying a thousand times you're having a bad outcome. You're saying that a thousand times it's something through you for a loop a bit, right? Yeah, I think this is why I look at neurologics exactly right, and I'm sorry if I gave people the wrong impression. This is exactly uh, why it takes seven years to train, because the human body, the human life, the human condition, the brain is so unique that the people that are permitted, I mean, it really is a blessing to get to operate on your brain or your spinal cord. The people that are permitted to do that have to be ready to to, to go to plan B at any given time. Yeah, I want to stop you there real quick and just interject a little anecdote because, my, yeah, as you know, Charles Liu, who's at USC and I were co-residents, and you know, like some of the folks listening are, are gonna go on the interview trail and you've, you're welcome, by the way, to use this. But, you know, they always ask the question, like, why do you want to be a neurosurgeon, right? right. And the people come like, the brain's interesting and all that. And Charles had the best answer. He goes, you know, cardiac surgery is close, but a pig heart and a human heart, eh, it's about the same. Right. But a pig brain and a human brain, wow, what a difference. Or a chimpanzee brain, right? And I love that answer because it really 
it's it's kind of saying what you're saying in a more kitschy way. Yeah. Um, but anyways, please continue about the plan. No, I, I, th- I think what distinguishes us in many ways is that the brain is an inscrutable organ. I mean, it's inscrutable. Real. Yeah, I mean, truly, we haven't, we have really just scratched the surface of understanding the brain. And so when a patient appears to you in the emergency room, what do you want? You want the, the, the smartest, the most clever, the most thoughtful, the most impassioned person there to kind of step back and figure out what's going on because what you think is going on may not be that and you have to have a blank slate. And I, you know, and I think that's what's great about neurosurgery and I'll give you a story. Let me give okay. you a story about that. So um, I am president of the Congress of Neurological Surgeons, one of our national organizations, big deal, okay? But I am- It is a big deal, by the way. Well, it's not. And this is what, 04? This is 06. 06, 06. 06. 2006, okay. And Mike Apuzzo was my, you you know, was my, the the honored guest. and, and, And he says, wouldn't it be great? He says to me, he says, if we can get some, kind of Hollywood guy, because he's so Hollywood, right. he's so California. Right. He's guy, I love Michael Puzzle. But he said, get, get me somebody big. So we go for the biggest fish we can, George Lucas. Okay. From Star Wars. From George Star Lucas. Wars. George Lucas from Star Wars, from American Graffiti, one of the great writers, producers, uh, uh, he's he's running, he, he's running a film company, Lucas Films, uh-huh. right? So we call him up and tell him who we are. And I think it just intrigued him because of course he's gonna say no. Right. I mean, anybody at that level is gonna say no to us. But of course, what does he do? He says, that sounds interesting to me, mm. yes. So I fly to San Francisco to meet with him. I don't meet with him, I meet with his assistant. Wait, right? did you go to Skywalker Ranch? No, 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 not, okay, Skywalker, not, Skywalker, Ranch, okay. not Skywalker Ranch, to his, uh, to, to the Presidio. Where oh. he had, where he had his uh, film factory, basically, where you know, um, that's where all the stuff was done. And I go there, and I, his assistant said, "You just missed him." I'm sorry. I know, <laughs> I know oh. he promised you, you know. So she showed me around, and she showed me all, all all the things he does. But she says he's really intrigued by this. I said, "Great." He just has to come. He has to be our uh, creativity guest. Give, give a you know, give a talk. She said, "Sure, sure, sure. No problem. He'll be fine." So the day comes. Wait, this didn't make you nervous at all? You no, never, no th- email traffic? Like, oh, yeah, I'm coming. And we're neurosurgeons. Oh, we're, right? So I figured, oh, what could no. go wrong? What could go wrong? What could go wrong? Yeah. So I, he, there's a green room. It's, it, it's like, you know, it's like the Johnny Carson show, right? There's a green room. People are waiting in there. Yeah, there and- is larger than life. One of our heroes, we grew up with Star Wars, George Lucas, he's sitting there. And, and for, for our international audience, uh, a green room is like, if you're going on a, a TV show, for example, they put everybody in this room so you can prepare, maybe even do makeup, but you're kind of decompressing, ready to be called on stage, right? It's kind of like that, okay. Right, it's just like a living room off stage. Okay. And you walk from your living room onto, sta- onto the stage, exactly right. So he- here we are in the green room and I go in to meet him. It's five minutes, 10 minutes till he gets on. And I said, Mr. Lucas, thank you very much. He says, oh no, this sounds really interesting. I wanted to do this. And I said, uh, you have, I'm thinking he has some magnificent movie displays. He has clips from all, you know, Star Wars, yeah. American Graffiti. It's, this is gonna yeah, be it's gonna be a big production. I, yeah, I said, um, you have your talk ready. He says, what do you mean to talk? <laughs> And I said, well, you know, PowerPoint. He looks at me and George Lucas says, what is PowerPoint? I, and it is, this is 2006, so people know what PowerPoint is, yeah, right? Yeah, Right, but not George Lucas because he thinks in, you know, 88 millimeters or whatever. Yeah. He thinks in bigger. He thinks in cinema. And he, I, I said, well, um, I'm thinking, oh, my God, are we going to have to scrap this? Because he doesn't have anything ready. He says, well, um, I'm thinking. I said, well, what do you think we should do? He says, well, I thought you were just going to talk to me. So I look around and I see all the union guys standing there, you know, ready to get him on stage, you know, the production people. 
And I turned to um, the lead guy and I said, hey, you see that couch she's standing on? Pick that up, put it on the stage. There's a <laughs> chair next to it. Take a chair. I'll sit over there. Wire him up. We go out. And there's 2,000 people in the audience waiting There are 2,000 people in the audience. <laughs> They're waiting for video and yeah. PowerPoint and this magnificent yeah, yeah, yeah. The, movie. The music, the lead-in for Star Wars or something. Exactly. Like, yeah. And out comes, um, you know, me, humble me, and this world-famous guy who was as humble and kind as you can be. And we sat on the stage. And it was a totally unvarnished talk. The first question I have from George Lucas, thank you very much for coming. I need to ask you, um, how did you get inspired for your first movie, which was American Graffiti? He looks at me, he said, listen, I grew up in California. I'm a kid who works in his dad's hardware store. That's what my dad did for a living. He said he wasn't a movie producer, he was no one famous. And he says, what do you think about when you're a teenage boy growing up in California? Cars and women, beautiful women. <laughs> and he said, that's what the movie's about. And he said, oh my gosh, that is inspired. Wow, yeah. And then, then, then I asked him, what about Star Wars? He says, are you kidding? I almost went broke. He tells the story that now is famous. This is one of the first times he's telling the story about how the banks wanted to put him out of business. Really? The actors thought this was the craziest idea. That You know, can you imagine getting... Um, Dressing up as a Wookiee. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is this? It, it, they're all looking at each other. They're saying, oh my gosh, this guy is nuts. Yeah, nuts. This is never going to work. Right. And he says, I couldn't get funding from the bank. We were like one day from shutting down. Anyway, long story short, what I learned is this is pure neurological surgery. We went from total failure to plan A to plan B, and it was a magnificent success from his perspective. I asked him, how did that go? He said, that was awesome. He said, I had such a great time. I've never told some of these stories. And I think now we've moved to neurological surgery. If somebody wants to not give a PowerPoint talk, some very, you know, death through PowerPoint, I call it. You know, you get up there and you throw a lot of numbers and pictures at people. Instead, just sit down and do a conversation and talk from the heart. It is as good as anything else out there. And that's the most popular part of the Congress meeting now. Right, uh, right. Saying, like Hunt Bajor was interviewing Bush. Right, In interviewing past President Bush, exactly. Steve Wozniak was being interviewed. Yes. He, I mean, it was, it's the best part of the Congress now. And I think they like it. They don't have, the, 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 the superstar that you're inviting doesn't have to prepare anything. But what people didn't realize, and I think you and I have talked about, is that's just plain neurological surgery. Now, I want to thank you for that, by the way, because there's a picture that I put in a lot of my talks and I display prominently in my house. It's me and uh, my three young children, uh, which is a rare picture of the four of us together, with George Lucas at the Peninsula Hotel with the reception afterwards. I have the same picture with my two boys. My daughter was there as well with my two boys that they cherish it to this day. The con they sat down. George Lucas is such a wonderful human being and a modest man. He sat down with these two boys who went, you know, of course, they know everything about Star <laughs> right, Wars. Right, yeah. And they're talking to him and he was totally enthralled with it. And, and it was it was a memory. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think, you know, you can't, I always say to people, can't be a prophet in your own kingdom. I think that day <laughs> you and I were prophets in our oh, own geez. kingdom. Our kids didn't think we were as, uh, you know, that was as dorks as they probably normally <laughs> think we of are. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's a, that's such a wonderful story. So, so will you share with me a story and, and we don't need to identify anybody, but we have stories every day yes. of how that, you know, we, we've actually been trying not to get too wonky about neurosurgery on this podcast right. because other people are trying to fill that space. But I, I think along these lines, share with me a story that's like this, but now instead of moving a couch, you're in your OR theater in Seattle. Right. I mean, sometimes what you find in neurological surgery, if you go into a, somebody's brain or spinal cord, and 99% um, and of the time, I don't want people out there to think things go wrong, but 99% of the time you planned out the operation, you have all the equipment you need, and it's like a symphony, and it's choreographed, and it goes beautiful. Right. 
but that is not what you ever remember because you expect it to go like that every time. But the beauty about our field is of all of a sudden you get in there and it's not what you think. Mm -hmm. It's not a tumor of the pineal region, but instead it's a tumor of the thalamus or it's a tumor infiltrating a part of the brain you didn't expect. Mm -hmm. That's where you go to plan B and you change your entire trajectory, you change your plan, and you do whatever is best for the patient. Because what you know, I think what every neurosurgeon knows, is that if you freeze at that moment, if you stop what you're doing and throw your hands up at that moment, uh, just like the boxer, no moss, okay? Yeah. This patient may die, or this patient may have an unfortunate outcome. But that's not how we think. Right. We want a perfect outcome every single time or the best we can do. Because we remember, we know it, the disease is the bad thing. Uh, not the patient just has a, between that disease or condition and, uh, and them is us. Right. And so what is so beautiful about the seven years of training is it trains you to then change everything you're about, you're doing that you plan to do and do the best thing for the patient at that time and that is why i tell my residents why training is so wrong because that is conditioning that's uh, that's a fine athlete's way of approaching a race for example you have to be ready at any second to change the plan to change what you do, to deal with any catastrophic thing that comes up. The worst thing, of course, when you're doing neurological surgery is when things bleed. Mm -hmm. So vessels burst uh, or, um, uh, or tumors bleed or uh, uh, things like that. And the last thing that patient can have you do as a neurologic surgeon is panic and say, that's not the way I planned it. Well, you no. touch on so many important things. I mean, I, I, I told the residents in Miami, because it's, it's, it's an interesting program, and I was at SC, as you know, USC yes. forever, and I was a faculty member, that the entire second year of USC is just to learn how to stop bleeding. Because we invented most of the hemostatic mechanisms in surgery today by right. neurosurgeons, and we're the one field that, you know, it's not about bleeding to death. It's the consequence of that blood, right? The right. brain is compressed or destroyed by it because it's so soft. But I, I want to go back to this issue. And I, I, I also tell the residents that maybe it's the definition of a surgeon, not necessarily a neurosurgeon, is that you make decisions and take action in the absence of complete information, which is every day, every action, right? Absolutely. And, well, oh, incomplete information. Incomplete. You may, and that's the worst part of it is because you may have incomplete information that leads you down the wrong the, the wrong road and you have to be able to step back and then take the right direction and i think the true measure of uh, you know the great neurosurgeons we see in our field is their ability to re to react under duress right so you, you said about freezing up and i want to come back to this because there's some younger folks listening to us let's say you have a, re a trainee who has a tendency to freeze up which, uh, let's be honest, you see that a lot in medical fields, right? Yeah. Let's just have you come back on another clinic day or another right. test, right? But we're live. We're working live. And that, this resin, we've seen this before, I know, it has difficulty with that sort of, what do they call it? It's like the, the, the armadillo reaction right. or whatever it is. And the armadillo's right. jump. It's uh, what plays dead. Something, some animal that plays dead, yeah. right? Yeah. Possum. Possum. That's, that's the, the possum. animal. The possum reaction. How do you... I mean, is it hopeless? How do you train that person to not be that? Well, I think, I, I think you know, obviously there's an after action report, but what you say to the- An after action report? You sit and talk to, that's not the time okay. to, to um, when you're doing an operation and your assistant freezes up. And um, that's probably not the time to cr critique them because they're gonna unravel. And so what you have to explain to them is what I tell them. I, I say, the true measure of how we evaluate you is going to be what you do under duress because patients don't come with conditions that you perhaps have seen in the form you've seen before. And I think what you have to remember is the only thing between you and some horrific outcome perhaps, uh, between the patient and some horrific outcome is you. And you have to remember 
that this starts from ground zero. Because if all of a sudden there's bleeding and you say, but the operation was going great until then, now what do I do? The next thing you know, neurosurgeons reflexively cover the bleeding up, tamponade it, and then go, okay, let's work backwards, figure out what happened here, mm -hmm. and I've got to stop it because I want to get this patient off the operating room table, cured and perfect. Mm -hmm. And I said, the only person in the world that can do that is the person standing over that patient's brain. And I think as soon as slowly people understand that, that there's choice A, something bad, and choice B, something good. Take that good thing mm -hmm. every single time. And the only way you can do it is first take your own pulse, calm yourself down, and remember you're starting from ground zero you now have to save a life. And I think that people get that. And I think that's partly why, not the whole reason why, you know, there's a lot to learn in neurological surgery because the anatomy is so complex and so on, and it's so beautiful. But that's partly why is it's like training an athlete. It takes those seven years to get. So I don't ever think anybody's hopeless. Um, I think you, uh, some people are faster at that than others. Some, and, and most of us self-select. Most of us, if you could not do that, you probably wouldn't go in the field. People, I, I know um, some of my colleagues that are internal medicine doctors, they're wonderful people, but they don't, they say, look, I, I don't want to live my life in the emergency room like you do, or in the operating room where every day really matters in a life and death way. And those people self-select themselves to do something that is different and more, um, let's say, not, there's nothing more meticulous than neurological surgeon, but something more controlled. Mm -hmm, right. And so I, I think that's one of the beauties of our field is this, um, this absolute, um, uh, uh, um, mystery. I mean, we don't necessarily know 100% of the time what's next, mm -hmm. what we're coming up against until we're there. And if you've seen one patient, you've seen one patient. Right. That's, okay. a, that's it's one of those fields. And, and, and we're so, and the reason neurological surgeons are meticulous is because we take nothing for granted. We never yeah. go in there. This is routine. Right. There's never a routine operation. There's not never, a single, not a carpal tunnel. There's no, no. such thing. It's not like on TV. And that, it's not like that. And I think that's why neurological surgeons are so compulsive and meticulous and they have great outcomes because they never take anything as an assumption that it'll just be okay. Okay, yeah. so we're on edge, and we're um, we're sprinting every single time we're in that room, and I think it's there's a beauty to that. There, there there's a beauty knowing that you can save somebody's life and change the course not only of that patient, but all the people around them, and that in order to do that is there you have to have that inner calm. And that ability, as I told you about George Lucas, go to plan B, yeah. go to plan C if you have to. But whatever it is, is we're going we're, we're gonna to do something great here. And I think, um, I, I think that's what I most appreciate uh, about uh, going, you know, if you take a vacation for a week, um, you know, getting back into the operating room is a big deal. Yeah. Okay. You know, you're excited. You you can't wait to get back in the operating room. Once you get back in, the first question is, am I going to be as sharp as I was? A That's week right. Ago? That's okay, right. Because I've got to be on my A game every single day. Awesome. Well, Rich, thank you for your time. This has been wonderful. And we'll have to have you back on again. Thanks. I appreciate that, Michael. <laughs>